Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to the 2023 Green Coffee Summit. If you weren't with us yesterday, I'll reintroduce myself. Um, my name is Andres Montenegro, Sustainability Director at the Specialty Coffee Association, and also one of the hosts for this year's digital event. Yesterday, during our day one uh, of the Green Coffee Summit, we'll learn from a select group of experts innovating in on value models for green coffee, from new and innovative processing technologies to extrinsic attributes, intangible value, and inclusive business built on, on quality, but on quality of the relationships and information flows. All these innovations are somehow challenging um, and keep expanding our understanding of what a specialty coffee is and also the possibilities for our sector. Suggesting probably a more generative path based not on managing scarcity, but on the opportunities to transition to new forms of abundance, value in general to make coffee better for all. Um, we were able to hear how the value discovery, uh, a vital term in the world of specialty coffee, uh, through the use of tools like the SEA uh, coffee value assessment, a bold shifting in searching strategies to not just discover value, but to design it. And today we will keep digging and exploring on those practical innovations that are and will be in the future, keep shifting um, green coffee towards a more intentional industry that will expand value as a design goal to create coffees and coffee experiences designed and tailored to meet consumer preferences. Um, but also tackling the present sustainability challenges of the global specialty coffee sector as it continues to evolve towards this future. Before we head into our first session, I would like to thank today's presenters and panelists for sharing their time and experiences. And also highlight that the Green Coffee Summit, a free to attend online event is made possible thanks to the support of our generous sponsors. Thank you to our title sponsor, Barista Attitude and supporting the sponsors, BWT, Water and More and Carabella Coffee for your support. Now I'm going to pass the baton to my colleague, Peter Giuliano, Executive Director of the Coffee Science Foundation and Chief Research Officer at the Specialty Coffee Association, who will be the host for our first session of the day. Welcome again, and the floor is yours, Peter. Thanks, Andres, uh, uh, and thanks for uh, the welcome today. Uh, it's great to see you, and I'm excited for day two of the summit. Um, okay, everyone. Well, today, um, as Andres just said, my job requires me to be involved with um, with science and research. And um, one thing that uh, the research definitely shows us, which includes the consumer research, the market research, um, and other scientific research, is the world is changing. Uh, uh, it's changing in big ways and small ways. The um, biggest change, of course, that we think about all the time is the, the changes that are happening in the world's climate. And of course, that's going to have a profound effect on uh, coffee and its agriculture and its trade. But um, coffee is changing in different ways, too. Uh, uh, populations are growing and changing. Uh, consumer groups are growing and changing. Uh, and uh, the trade dynamics in the world are changing all the time. And we respond to change with innovation, um, naturally. That's what we are as a species. We innovate in the face of um, change and in the face of adversity. And that's what this morning's session is really about. Yesterday, we learned, uh, as Andres just mentioned, yesterday we learned about all sorts of other kinds of in, in innovations. We learned about processing innovations um, to discover new flavors in coffee. We learned about trade innovations, about how companies are innovating their trade systems to um, make coffee better through the way that they work within their supply chains. We learned about uh, value assessment innovations, about how new tools that have been developed are, are, um, are uh, making it possible to make progress in the uh, in uh, the trading of coffee. 
Today, we're going to look at agricultural innovation. Of course, coffee begins at the agricultural stage. Um, and, uh, and just like in every other part of the coffee industry, agriculture needs to innovate in order to adapt to all of these changes that we've just talked about. So that's our focus this morning, and we've got three speakers who are in the trenches of this kind of ad, uh, of innovation right now, and we've asked them to share their perspectives and their work. So I've got um, we've got three talks this morning. I'll introduce them now, and then um, after those three talks, we'll have a chance to discuss and um, ask questions. I encourage you all to ask questions in the chat as we go, and discuss in the chat as we go. And um, we'll be able to learn about uh, about what innovation looks like in the agricultural, in the coffee agricultural sector. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we've got three uh, uh, amazing speakers this morning. The first, um, they'll go in order. They'll each have they have uh, three talks prepared. The first is Craig Kraft. He is the Asia and Africa director for World Coffee Research. Um, he's an agroecologist and um, has worked in agricultural development and sustainability for over 15 years. After Craig, we'll have uh, Dr. Tanya Humphrey. She is the Director of Research and Development of World Coffee Research, and she oversees WCR's research portfolio. And she's always been passionate about innovation in agriculture um, and the integration with business. So Tanya is the second one. And then our third speaker is uh, Jane Chesarek. She is a research scientist at the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization, um, uh, which is the Coffee Research Institute. Um, and uh, Jane has been with the Kenya, Ag the, the, this Coffee Research Institute for 12 years working in breeding programs um, set uh, aimed at developing new coffee varieties. So um, I'm really eager to share these uh, three talks with you about what agricultural innovation looks like. So first, we'll begin with Craig's talk. Take it away, Craig. My name is Craig Kraft. I'm the Asian Africa Director at World Coffee Research. It's a pleasure to share with you a short panel presentation here on coffee's agricultural innovation crisis, um, the missing opportunities create value for farmers. I'll be joined today by my colleague, Dr. Tanya Humphrey, who will present on how breeding can create value for farmers. And finally, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Chain Chesarek of the Kenyan Coffee Research Institute, who will provide a specific example from Kenya. As I go through these slides, I recognize that my camera hides a little portion of the, of the slide, so I'll be um, popping in and out so you can clearly see the pictures or uh, the words on each of these slides. So, uh, and again, I want to thank the SCA for inviting us to participate uh, in the Green Coffee Summit. First of all, we're going to start looking at how climate change will and currently affects coffee and coffee production. If we take a look at a global macro level, we know that increases in temperature changes the suitability of where coffee can be grown. The increase in severe weather events can lead to major ramifications, not only for farmers who are directly affected, but these shocks are felt throughout the supply chain. We only need to think about the how the market and the global supply chain reacts when there are floods in Vietnam or frosts in Brazil. But the bottom line is that ultimately farmers bear the brunt of these risks. 
if we zoom down into a plant or field level, we can see how climate change impacts Arabica coffee. Increases in temperature mean that there are lower yields and poorer quality, where limiting water also has the same effect. Finally, irregular rains and patterns of rainfall can cause poorly distributed flowering, which means that harvests don't come at the same time or you're harvesting all year. Um, and these have real impacts to, to growers because as we are seeing, uh, scarcity of labor is becoming one of the constraints to, to coffee production today. So if you have seen uh, a WCR presentation recently, you've probably seen this slide. Um, based on the facts that I've shared with you, right, the coming of climate change, it seems like in coffee, we see this disaster coming and yet we're, we're casually waiting for it. When really what we need is something on the right. We, we need to be prepared. We need to make the investments in technologies and innovation that are going to prevent the disasters that we see forthcoming. Innovation is critical. Just 10 years ago, farmers in Central America and Mexico were facing a devastating leaf rust epidemic. The solution to this was the development and distribution of varieties that are resistant to leaf rust. Too many farmers are using varieties and technologies that were created 50, hundreds of years ago. They, these, these trees are direct descendants of the original trees that were taken to start populations in Indonesia and Latin America. Uh, these, they don't have any of the innovations that farmers need today. But why is this, right? Well, the problem isn't technical, right? We saw that there were, it was a technical solution to, to coffee leaf rust in new varieties. There is a structural problem with investment in coffee agricultural research and development. So WCR worked with a Michigan State University agricultural economist Dr. Maiwish Meredia, to calculate the value of the investment that is needed in order to avert this coming crisis. So right now, the global coffee industry collectively invests around $115 million a year in agricultural innovation. So assuming that coffee consumption is gonna to continue to increase at historical rates, and that climate change does indeed reduce yields and land area for coffee, and that you still, that traders and roasters want to continue to purchase coffee from other origins besides Brazil and Vietnam, then we need to be investing in research and development at a level that is approximately five times more than what we are. We need to invest an additional $452 million a year to to hit that 556 million mark. You may be thinking that is an enormous number, right? That is a lot of money. Just the other day, I was reading a DevEx article that cited that the global coffee industry is collectively worth $127 billion. It's billion with a B. Um, our friends alone in Vietnam uh, have a farm gate production that's worth four to five billion dollars. So if the global value is 127 billion dollars, this number, 567 million dollars, represents 0.4 percent 
of that global value. So we think of this in terms of relative percentage, it's less than 1%, it's less than half a percent. If we look at how variety innovation, we're gonna shift the, the, the topic now to how variety innovation can contribute increase value to, to farmers, right? We've seen that there is a structural reason why there has not been historic, there, there, historically, there has not been enough investment in a research development. WCR, we focus on varieties and variety development and innovation. So we're gonna look at how variety innovation can address multiple sustainability issues and add value for farmers, right? By increasing the quality and the amount of coffee farmers get, increasing the financial stability and profitability, decreasing agrochemical use potentially through increasing tolerance to disease and pests, um, reducing pressure on land use conversion and deforestation because farmers are getting more per area that they have planted. Innovation has been the cornerstone in plant breeding to solve multiple challenges. So you can see plant breeding has gone through its own uh, innovations. Uh, there have been innovations in the way that we have been undertaking plant breeding, right? Breeding 1.0, farmer selection, you see something interesting in your farm, you save seed, you continue to propagate it. Breeding 2.0, we start to use information from experimental design um, to improve how we create new varieties. And 3.0 and 4.0, we start to leverage the power of genetic analysis, spatial analysis, our ability to, to identify where traits sit in the genome in order to really create um, new varieties of uh, of crops. Coffee is still in 2.0, breeding 2.0. There's a lot of room and space for us to to continually to innovate and create varieties that provide solutions to challenges that we are currently facing. Here's one example that. Uh, we've used at WCR. If you look at levels of innovation comparing to what has been done in strawberries versus coffee, we see that there are over 6,000 varieties of strawberries registered in the Union for Protection of New Varieties of Plants versus 111 coffee varieties registered, meaning that there's approximately nearly 60 times more innovation in strawberry breeding than in coffee we recognized that for each country, varieties are competitive. Everyone is trying to solve for their own production issues and create varieties that are locally adapted, um, making sure they've got the qualities that growers want. Right? In order to respond to this, we need a, a stronger system of innovation, right? One that um, allows for greater investment and includes more actors. The next couple of talks, my colleague Tanya will talk a little bit directly about how plant breeding can contribute to innovation and one example from WCR. And then our partner, Jane Chesarek, will go with a really specific example of how that's worked in Kenya. So I wanna thank you for your attention today and I'll let uh, Tanya take over. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tanya Humphrey and I'm the Director of Research and Development for World Coffee Research. So you've just heard from Craig about the importance of innovation in coffee. Um, and I'm going to zero in a little bit closer on specifically on the topic of a variety improvement. 
So when we think about agricultural innovation, whether it's in coffee or any other crop, typically you can innovate in two ways. And the first is through better agro ag agronomy. So this means agronomic interventions like fertilizer, irrigation, pruning, pest control, all of the things that a farmer can do to really maximize um, productivity in the crop. So the, this is the first, the first thing, but after a while, typically you kind of reach a maximum. You've optimized every possible element of the production system and you can't really get any more productivity gains out of that. And so this is where you start to think about varieties. So the plant itself, you really want the best variety uh, in the ground that, that is adapted and maximized for performance in the specific environment in which it's being grown. And so variety innovation typically comes through improvement, through breeding and selections to optimize that variety for the specific production systems. And so the two things together, varieties plus agronomy, typically will get the maximum performance out of any agricultural system. And so you saw this slide er earlier, perhaps it's, uh, it shows in clearly in a single photograph the importance of the right variety in the right location. So on the left, we have a coffee variety that is being um, subjected to the coffee leaf rust, which is serious disease of coffee. And you can see that the plant has lost a lot of its leaves. It's not very healthy. And obviously the farmer is not going to get much yield out of this plant. But on the right, you see a coffee variety that is resistant to coffee leaf rust and it is healthy and vigorous and will give the farmer a good crop. And so this is a simple illustration of having the right variety and how it really can make a difference for farmer livelihoods and ultimately for the production of coffee in on a farm, in a region, in a country and indeed in the, the entire world. So. Variety improvement is something that humans have been doing for thousands of years. Since the start of agriculture, we have been selecting and improving on the plants that we grow. And this is a great illustration here from another crop, a watermelon. The top left uh, picture shows what a watermelon looked like in its natural state. The very original watermelon was a small, hard fruit with tough tough pulp, it was bitter, you couldn't open it, and clearly it was not very desirable. And so over time, by growing this and selecting more and more the sweeter, bigger, juicier fruit, over time we got to a point around 100 years ago where we had these giant, sweet, juicy watermelons. Some, some of them are still around today. Uh, but with more modern and sophisticated approach, we've, we've refined that even further so that we have a whole range of different watermelons in different sizes, flavors, even different colors uh, for different markets. And so all of that diversity is inherently there in the crop. And that's what breeding and selection can do, take something uh, very small and almost undesirable and turn it into something great. And so breeding really works. And the basically, as I just explained for watermelon, it happens over time and through generations of growing the plant and selecting the, um, the best performers, you're able to incrementally improve on, in the traits that you're looking for. So you can think about it a little bit like shuffling a deck of cards. So if you shuffle a deck of cards and then you, you look at what you've got and you throw out all the bad ones, just keep the good ones and then you reshuffle. And then you, you look at that again and you take the good ones and throw out the bad ones. And if you do that repeatedly, what you end up with is a small selection of really the only the best material or the best cards in this example. And so this is how breeding works. It's, it's really relatively simple and humans have done it since they've been growing plants uh, grow for agriculture. And we do it now today still in nearly every agricultural crop that's grown uh, for commercial purposes. And so Certainly, it's something that needs to be happening in coffee. And so breeding in coffee, we really need to be thinking about optimizing coffee varieties for the production environments that they're growing in. And particularly as we're facing a future with climate change, increasing demand for, for coffee consumption, uh, as well as uh, pest and disease pressures, 
all of the 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 challenges that the coffee industry is facing we need to really ensure that farmers are making the most out of the resources they have available and that farmers can can grow a profitable crop and stay in coffee production so this is why we need to do breeding and typically Breeding so far in coffee has been relatively underinvested. So you heard about the innovation gap in investment in coffee. In breeding, that is definitely the case because breeding is a long-term effort. It requires significant investment over a sustained period of time to really achieve great things. And in coffee, it, it generally hasn't happened. So when we think about breeding for the coffee industry, we talk a lot about demand-led breeding. And this means what does the industry want and need? So when we talk about the industry, what we mean is the entire chain, right from the farmer through to the end consumer. And we need to think about what everyone along that, that chain needs. And so first and foremost, we consider the farmer. And that's these are the production traits, the things that the farmer needs out of the coffee plant. And so typically there'll be things like yield, uh, seed quality, pest and disease resistance, perhaps drought tolerance, nutrient use efficiency, plant architecture, whether it's tall or short, how many branches it has in, in what kind of uh, structure. All of these things affect the way a farmer produces their crop. And we need to consider them and understand the genetic determinants of these things to allow us to be able to make those selections. So we Think about the farmer first and foremost, but ultimately coffee is a consumer a product. So we really need to understand what is the consumer looking for? What are the traders and the roasters and the people along the value chain? What are they looking for when they buy coffee? And of course, this is where the whole discussion around quality comes in. We really need to understand quality. We need to incorporate it into the breeding pipeline. And we need to understand how we can make improvements that really maximize the genetic potential that you're getting out of the variety uh, so that we can make sure that we've got the highest quality material. So all of these things, all of these needs and wants uh, in the industry basically can get be translated towards uh, to become target traits for a breeding program. So when we think about targeting some of these improved traits, we really want to look at what is the material we're starting from. And so in the breeding program that we have just launched, we're looking at the highest priority traits of yield, which is ultimately productivity for the farmer, which benefits the farmer and the buyer and everyone down the chain to really maximize the, the what you're getting out of the resources that are put into it. So yield is really important. Disease resistance uh, would, would usually come second because you want the plant to be resistant to whatever it's encountering in the field. And there are many natural sources of disease resistance that we can incorporate into uh, the coffee coffee varieties. So yield, disease resistance, and then the other one is cup quality. So thinking about the end consumer, making sure that the breeding and the selections focuses on the highest quality material that we can get. And so in designing this breeding program, we've thought about all of these things and we've we've focused on high performing commercial lines because this is an industry a business farmers need to make money out of this um, and we have material that is sourced from many different places across the world so brazil india kenya costa rica nicaragua and we have our global multi-year data set from this large international multi-location variety trial where we have been evaluating all of these varieties for six or seven years. So we have all of this data on all of this variety's performance in many different environments. We've evaluated this material in around 30 sites around the world in 18 different countries. And from that, we've got a lot of data that enables us to select the best material. And this has formed the basis of our breeding population. So we have launched a global breeding network in, called Innovea, and we launched this in late 2022. So it's still relatively new. We're in the first, very first stages of getting the seed distributed to partners and the trees in the ground. And so you can see in this diagram up on the right, all of the countries that have signed on as part of this collaborative network. And so the key thing about this is it's a global collaboration where all of these countries and researchers 
teachers and breeders across the world are working together to, to evaluate the same material in these many different environments and all of the data comes together and we're all sharing all of the material so that we we all of these countries um, will benefit from the outcomes of this network and we can ensure the successful origins diversity of origins so three three aspects to this network that are important that i wanted to highlight is the focus first the focus on high performing commercial varieties the second is a kind of a technical thing it's a population improvement strategy which is how the breeding is is being designed and the third is multi-environment testing so this is really important especially as we think about climate change because breeding is such a long-term endeavor what we're breeding for today really needs to be targeting the climates of the future so having this multi-environment testing in this global network structure really allows us to understand the performance of, of all of this genetics genetic material in many different environmental conditions and gives us information that we can predict what we will need uh, in those varieties in future climates. The other thing about this network that's actually really nice is the concept of co-opetition. So you see, for individual countries, varieties are inherently competitive. Each country is competing with their neighboring countries for market share, for quality. Uh, they want to be maximizing the, the productivity of their farmers, the price they're getting for coffee coming out of the, their country, the quality. So each country is going to want the variety that's best adapted to their own specific conditions and market needs. And so with Innovea, what we have is this pre-competitive collaboration where all of these countries come together and work collaboratively across the globe to develop this improved population of genetic material that we're all able to share and, and benefit from uh, so that individual countries then can take what they want from that material and further do further breeding and refinement to develop a finished variety that is ultimately going to meet the needs of their own farmers and position their country uh, in the best way on a competitive basis. So it really allows them still to maintain that, that competition that they're looking for. So that's all I've uh, got to say. And of course, uh, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any about, uh, about this. My name is Jane from Coffee Research Institute under the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization. And I'm going to present about breeding for cup quality in Kenya. Breeding for cup quality is one of the objectives within the coffee improvement program. And the various aspects of quality include the physical, which is the bean sizes, the biochemical aspects of the green bean, and organolytic characteristics, which is the liquoring of coffee. Genotypes such as geisha, the typicals and the bobons, are key genotypes for specialty markets because of its highest cup quality. Unfortunately, these genotypes are very susceptible to coffee diseases, including the coffee leaf rust and coffee berry disease. And thus are not profitable to farmers unless the farmers use chemicals such as fungicides to control them. Over 80% of the coffee farmers in Kenya are smallholder farmers. And so we need to produce genotypes that reduce cost of production in terms of resistance to coffee diseases and also with this we have to ensure that whatever we produce is of high quality, high yielding for the farmers and also this is resistant so that we can be able to maximize on the returns of coffee production. 
expression of quality is determined by the altitudes where the different coffees are grown and so it's important to select our coffees in different altitudes from the low to high since we know that with high altitudes we have a better expression of cup quality the g by e effects are critical in breeding for stability studies across the different environments for all the traits including quality we have to produce a variety that is stable and can be able to produce these characteristics that the farmer and the consumer needs the different areas that affect the expression of quality the first one is the varietal effects different genotypes different, uh, perform differently in terms of cup quality and so it's important that when we select we are able to select against those that have low cup quality the environment also affects the expression of these genotypes for cup quality and as indicated earlier it's important to be able to select for a variety that is stable across environments and is high in terms of cup and yield. The consistency of cuppers in assessing quality is very critical. Cuppers in one country or region and cuppers in another region should be able to assess the same beans from the same varieties, from the same location and be able to give results that are consistent and with very low variations in terms of results. So consistency is very important. There are many opportunities through value addition that allow the beans to express themselves in terms of cup. And this include the various processing methods, such as the naturals, honey process coffee and also the wet processing methods publications of bean qualities have been done on over 1400 papers have been published and over 50 percent of these journals focus on the biochemical composition of the green bean the cup quality, which is the sensory characterization, and the bean quality in terms of bean sizes. And so this shows how critical quality is important in the breeding program. And within the same study, just found out that more than 70% focused on Arabica coffee which is a species of coffee known to have high cup quality. And this was followed by the carnivora species. Breeding for cup quality is important. The higher the altitude, the higher the cup. But other factors also contribute towards expression of quality, which is the genotype the environment and management management basically is under the control of the farmer how the farmer feeds the coffee in terms of nutrition and crop management other factors include the pre and post harvesting processing methods the different centers within the coffee research institutes in different coffee agroecological zones where we plant all our genotypes and be able to study how are they stable in terms of cup quality and also yield across the different environments. Research and development has been focusing more on yield, the disease resistance, the quality of the coffees, being worked on and also adaptability in different environments. For the farmer, yield is very important 
and also the quality in terms of bean sizes, which is a price determinant. The marketer looks at the quality and the volumes that the farmer produces. We have the rosters within the value chain and the final stakeholder within the value chain is consumer. The consumers play a big role because they are the determinants of what do they want. And so within this breeding cycle we have to consider demand-led breeding where we have to have different product profiles and be able to look at this value chain what is needed at what point. And so our breeding program has to focus the need of every value chain player from the farmer to the consumer. The quality evaluation in terms of bean grade has been focusing on the different sizes based on the screen sizes. We have the E. We have the AAs, the ABs, the PBs up to T, which is the smallest in terms of size. And all these specific bean grades fetch different prices. And so it's important to know what are we producing to the farmers? What are we giving to the farmers? Do we have more of the AAs and ABs? Do we have more of Cs and Ts in these specific genotypes? And so we have to consider specific variety and also taking into consideration the returns the farmer would make from this specific genotype. The quality looks into coffee in three different aspects. We have the raw characterization of coffee, we have the roasted coffee and also in terms of liquor. All these different traits during sensory characterization contributes to that final class of a specific genotype which ranges between 1 and 10. For coffee, in Kenya for our own coffees we have to consider those varieties that have scores of more than 8. We have the 5 different varieties, we have the button and Ruru, which is an improvement of SL34, 28 and K7. They are resistant to diseases, they are high yielding, they have cup quality that scores more than 80. And so the aim of the breeding program is to come with new varieties that have these characteristics so that we can be able to take care of the farmer, reduce the cost of production and maximize the returns in terms of productivity. The Coffee market price within the Nairobi Coffee Exchange is shown for the last two years. How the performance of the various coffees and the payments that were made. Look at these charts, you find that the AAs through the PBs are fetching better prices. And so how can we be able to ensure that within the breeding programs we have the best genotypes? that produce more of the AAs, the ABs, and the PBs being bred so that the farmer can be able to get more money from their produce. And so bean quality is very critical in our breeding programs and we have to consider them in every step of breeding so that we can be able to get a good variety out there that has all these traits incorporated in it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jane, for that talk. Thanks, Craig. Um, Tanya, thank you for your uh, for uh, those excellent talks. That was uh, that was really interesting. Um, thank you all for the. For the, I feel like we've had a guided tour through um, agricultural and uh, and genetic information. So we've got some um, questions from the chat, um, but before we begin, I'd love with those. I'd love to um, sort of clarify a, a few things of of uh, of my own. So we used a there was a few terms being used in this uh, in this term in this 
talk, um, Jane was talking about genotypes a lot. Um, uh, we've, we've talked about um, other terms. What we're really talking about here is developing varieties, right? Which are some of these attributes that we were talking about uh, yesterday, these varieties that um, are well known um, in coffee. Some of these are really traditional. Jane's List had some of those varieties that are closely identified um, with Kenyan coffees. But is, 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 that, is that what we're talking about here is like developing sort of new versions of, 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 uh, of those varieties that we've come to be familiar with in coffee over the years? Um, I guess maybe Tanya, I'll ask you that question. Uh, yeah, sure, exactly. A new variety, a, a variety is a genotype, but not every genotype is a variety. So typically, you know, by the time you release a variety, you need to, it needs to be very well characterized. Um, but in a breeding program, you have a whole lot of different genotypes. And from that, you are selecting the ones that will ultimately be evaluated and selected to be released as a variety. But Yes, mostly a genotype and a variety in this context can be used interchangeably. Got it. Um, and uh, and so uh, so these these uh, these so these uh, ones we think of as varieties can be improved even when they're um, still thought of as the same variety. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it does get muddy in, in coffee because uh, the approach to uh, varieties um, and, and certainly the seed systems, it can be a little informal and unregulated in many places. Um, but in, in, you know, other, other crops, typically once a variety is released, it stays as that sp specific variety and it's preserved um, in that unique genotype. And so, but you can further do further breeding with it and then develop the next variety. So typically in many agricultural crops, what you have is kind of this constant pipeline of new varieties being released. And each variety is an improvement on the last one. And it will be released as its own unique variety. And ultimately farmers will, you know, eventually replace what's in their field with the, the best new stuff coming out. Got it. Okay, thank you. Craig, um, you mentioned different, uh different, and you and Tanya both mentioned other crops besides coffee, strawberries were mentioned, melons were mentioned, etc. cetera. Um, how does coffee, um, uh, how, how do these systems work in other industries? And how is that similar or different to coffee? Maybe Craig, start right. with you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, so in the, in the United States, if you look at uh, a crop, say um, apples or almonds, there is a checkoff program whereby every quantity of almonds or apples that gets sold, there's a fund that gets returned back um, to a board that then gets to direct that back into research and development. In the case of coffee, coffee is produced in a number of countries all across the world, the value addition and consumption happens in the United States. And there's really limited ways for, um, you know, for, for funds to get redirected back into uh, research and development that's going to continue to provide innovations that's going to allow for the future growth uh, of coffee. Um, you know, I think I just want to, uh, NCA had a recent publication that said, you know, Americans spend something like, uh, what is it, 200, $110 billion on coffee and related goods just in 2022. So, you know, I recognize that the numbers that we were talking about seem quite large, but they're really, we're talking about half a percent return back into uh, research and development. So there, there are systems established for crops that uh, are produced here in the United States and in North America, but because the production happens in other countries and the value addition and consumption happens here in the North, there isn't an easy way for the those funds to get back. Got it, thank you. Yeah, maybe I could just uh, build on that too, because uh, in a lot of agricultural crops, it's very much uh, focused in the commercial, the, the private sector. 
and certainly in many staple crops, annual crops, you know, uh, maize, wheat, soybean, these kinds of things are annual crops. There's a business model. There's a way to make money out of that because companies can sell seed every year. Um, and those companies, as we know, some of them are very large international companies, and that's the business of agriculture in those types of crops. Coffee is not an annual crop. It's a perennial. A farmer will... Uh, retain the same trees for 15 or more years and you know in some places it can even be up to 100 years of the same tree in the field producing coffee that whole time so there's not a great business if you're trying to sell seed uh, it, it's not going to be profitable so that fundamental uh, commercial aspect of the coffee variety and seed business uh, is, is kind of a, a weakness in, in in the system which means the whole thing needs to be supported by other mechanisms because there's not uh, seed companies that can really make a viable business out of this great thank you um jane there was a question in the in the chat that i thought maybe you could speak to a little bit we talked about testing of these varieties, how these, where, when these varieties actually get developed by the, um, the institutions that are associated with Innovea, um, and then they get tested and you'd list it, you had a very cool kind of list of different locations that, uh, that, um, that varieties can be tested at. There was a question about, and you listed the altitudes of those, of those places. How else do those differ from each other? Are they are they in Kenya? Are they geographically distributed? Um, are they managed any differently from each other, or um, what does that look like? I wonder if Jane maybe can you hear me, Jane? Yes, I can hear. Okay. Um, uh, I was I was wondering about the the locations where the varieties are tested um you 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 listed um them how do they differ from each other how what do those locations look like okay so the locations are located within all the coffee growing zones in kenya we have the lower regions which have low altitudes Actually, some regions even go up to 1,200 meters above sea level, and we have up to 2,000 meters above sea level. So they differ in terms of rainfall patterns, and also the soil structures, they're not the same. So we have to test, when we have to test all these varieties in this stage, all this, um, the different environments, we can be able to assess which is more stable in terms of quality, which one is stable in terms of, uh, in terms of, we can get almost the same quality across the different environments. So we need to look for stability. And that is the, the reason why we are doing this G by E selection so that we can be able to get a variety that is good, that is stable and will not really say like uh, performs better in this region and be very low in this other region. So with, we do the same management practices when actually we are doing uh, the management across the locations. So despite uh, being on higher load, if it is fertilizer, if it's agronomic practices, all the managing practices are really formed across the different environments. Yeah. Great. And this brings up, um, there was a question about, uh, about the data that winds up getting collected in, in, this, in, in the systems that uh, WCR has developed, like the multi-location variety trials, like Innovea, um, how does that information, that data, get shared with breeders, producers, et cetera? Um, maybe Tanya, you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a good question and something that we're working through right now. Particularly, you know, the multi-location variety trial is is where we start with where we evaluate essentially a whole lot of pre-existing that have been evaluated in twenty nine all around the world. So we have an extremely large data set that has, is coming out of that trial for the past uh, six, seven years now. And right, we're just, we're just starting to assemble this data and look at 
um, how to release that because we recognize how hugely valuable it is. We've already used the data ourselves in informing the breeding and the crosses that we're doing under Innovea, but we recognize that it's hugely valuable to all kinds of people. Uh, you know, uh, we get questions from coffee roasters and companies that are interested in different origins and they want to know if they're going to invest in a planting program in a particular country. They want to know how can we use this data to make the best variety choices for that country uh, right now. And so this data set is really valuable and we're in the process of trying to release it um, publicly. We want to do it by publishing it first in the scientific literature so that you know scientists can start digging into the data and do some analysis but as we do that we will be looking at how to release it publicly to make it more broadly available it's not a simple manner matter of just sort of dumping it somewhere publicly and letting everyone have it because there's sensitivities around some of this data and we have collaboration agreements with all of our partners in different countries um, about keeping this data you know uh, fairly uh, um, controlled um, uh, until the point at it, it's published and everyone's in agreement with that. So that's the process we're navigating right now. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to release as much of this data as possible because this is how research works. You know, everyone, science builds on results and data that has come before. And so it's all very well that we use the data to make our breeding selections or we give it to our partners, but the maximum benefit gets obtained when it's in the public domain and all kinds of people can use it for whatever they need. So that's our end goal. It's not so straightforward to get there and we're, we're working through that right now. Yeah. Okay, um, a couple of uh, specific questions that came up that um, that you all might be able to happen um, uh, answer. One was about Conifera. Um, are we talking about Arabica here? Are we talking about Conifera and Arabica? Um, other species? So, uh, yes, first. So what, what I talked about is Innovea specifically, which right. is our Arabica breeding program that we Got launched it. in 2022. So that all of that story is Arabica and Jane mostly talked about Arabica as well. Canephora is next and certainly it's pretty exciting for us because we're just getting involved in that now. It's, you know, it's a little further behind. We've just started this really in the past year or two, but that's the goal is to be having a global breeding program uh, in a Canephora, Robusta coffee as well. And we're right in the process now of designing the breeding strategy, talking to various partners who would might be involved in that global network. So absolutely, that's, um, that's part of the plan. As we start to think about other species, that's where we we have to really consider, uh, you know, is that the best use of our resources? Because, you know, we talked a lot about farmer productivity and commercial outcomes, industry-led, industry demand, these kinds of things. We have to we have to really focus on what's going to be profitable and viable in this whole commercial landscape. And right now, that's mostly Arabica and Canephora. Some of the other species are certainly interesting. As breeders, as scientists, we think about uh, those, we get a lot of questions about Stenophila. Um, it, it's certainly interesting, but there's a long way before those things become commercially viable. And so we're trying to focus on you know, the first and foremost, what's most important in the industry right now. Got it. And, and as you as you talked through that, I realized that really with uh, with WCR, you're talking about you're not talking about just one program. You're talking about lots of different things that are happening at the same yeah. time in different places with different um, uh, with in different ways. There was an, another question about how different countries vary in terms of their involvement um, in in these programs. Can maybe um, you all speak a little bit to, to this question about how, how, do, how do countries vary? Some countries seem to be very involved, some not as involved. What's the, how does that work out? Mm. Do you want to take that, Craig? Sure. Uh, right, so I think in, in Innovea, we're really targeting um, countries that second tier of, uh, of uh, Arabica producing countries, folks that, uh, you know, breeding programs that really need uh, assistance in, in keeping um, you know, the, the producers producing coffee. Um, we, um, you know, Brazil has a history of 
of investment and innovation into their varieties. And they're really an example for everyone to follow. I mean, we're, we're trying to get everyone to invest and develop varieties um, in the way that, that Brazil does, right? They've got varieties that are early ripening, late ripening, adapted to exactly what their, their farmers need. Um, but I think, you know, that doesn't preclude them from participating in the different aspects of, of Innovea or the other work that the BCR does. Um, we're currently exploring partnerships with a number of different countries in the Robusta network that um, don't, uh, that aren't participating in, in the Arabica breeding network. Got it. Okay, so finally, speaking about partnerships, I know um, a lot of people are asking, how can they be involved? I'm, you know, I might have a small company, a small roasting company or a small importing company. How can I get involved in, in this, uh, in this uh, work and become a partner um, with, uh, with WCR and these programs myself? Someone? Okay, I'll jump in. I think yeah. the the easy answer is membership in WCR. I mean, frankly, that that is why we are created. We create. We talk a lot about ourselves as the bridge between coffee companies and coffee producing countries. So typically, we work directly with national coffee institutes such as Calro. So Jane there in Kenya is one of our close partners. So we have a collaborative work underway with Calro and Jane and, and her broader team. Um, and that's how we tend to operate. So the involvement of companies typically is through membership. So, you know, companies invest in WCR because they see what we're doing. They understand the need to support R&D in coffee producing countries. And our organization provides the mechanism to allow them to do that. And so through membership in WCR, there's, you know, various ways to engage with us, get input into what we're doing, uh, as well as learn about uh, all of this process in a lot more detail. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chesarek, Dr. Dr. Humphrey, Dr. Kraft. Thank you so much for um, this. This was an exciting uh, session and I learned a lot. So um, thanks very much.